Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Augusto Zimmerman. He is the Dean of Law at the Sheridan Institute of Higher Education in, in Perth. He is also the president of the West Australian Legal Theory Association and editor-in-chief of the West Australian Juris Law Journal. Uh, he was a law reform commissioner for Western Australia from 2012 to 2017. Augusto was born and raised in Brazil, migrating to Australia in the early 2000s. He is legal and political commentary has appeared in numerous Australian publications, including Quadrant, The Spectator Australia, Cauldron Pool, The Good Source, The Unshackled, and most recently, The Epoch Times. He has authored and edited a long list of books over his academic career. The latest is Fundamental Rights in the Age of COVID-19, edited with his colleague, uh, Joshua Forrester, uh, published by Connor Court Publishing. I'm looking forward to discussing with him his, his book, uh, The State of the Rule of Law and uh, Human Rights in Australia, one year after the pandemic was declared, and also his thoughts on the West Australian state election fallout, including the near wipeout of the West Australian Liberal Party. Augusto, it's great to see you again, and welcome to Wilmsfront, because I haven't had you on this format before. Thanks, Tim. It's a great pleasure to talk to you again. Eh? You are doing a great job. Oh, thank you so much. Now, as I said, uh, you've uh, published and edited numerous uh, books, and uh, your most recent one is incredibly, incredibly timely. Mm -hmm. So, fundamental rights in the the age of COVID. So, you've edited this. There's topics on. Uh, various uh, aspects uh, of the, the the pandemic and associated lockdown, and obviously, uh, being a, a law professor, uh, you've been following the, well, the 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 imposition of these emergency laws, and well, they've basically been rubber stamped by the courts whenever there's been a a challenge. I think many Australians were quite shocked to realise that. Over the years, all of these emergency laws and powers uh, have, well, they've been passed bipartisanly. Nobody really paid attention to the time, yet they, ha they have the, they give the Premier the power to well, lock, as we've seen, lock down a whole state, uh, put the citizens under house arrest at a, at a moment's notice. It's, I think it's chilled quite a lot of people. Well, it, it, they should be because uh, history tells us that what is considered to be initially a temporary measure can easily become a permanent one when the, the, the dictators start to develop a taste for power and the measures then, rather than being just for a, a short period of time, they become more permanent ones. We are uh, taking a very bad uh, approach here, a very bad precedent, and I think uh, not only I feel uh, really uh, uh, worried about uh, what the premiers and the governments are doing, but what really scares me is the passivity of the people and the worship of government. I think in many ways as a result of the decline of the Christian faith in Australia, people are starting to develop another form of idolatry, which is the worship of government. And that is uh, uh, something that can cause us all sorts of problems, including the erosion, as I mentioned in my book, the book edited by me, of, of fundamental rights and freedoms, including uh, freedom of movement, conscience, and freedom of speech as well. Because we've seen in my home state of Victoria, the, the I stand with Dan's, the, the, the Dan stands who, who worship him, and it's even more... Uh, uh, you talk about the replacement of uh, religion or the, the Christian faith. Uh, I've heard stories over, over there of uh, West Australians getting tattoos of, of Mark McGowan. This is another very terrible, scary development. I think the fear of death now has paralyzed uh, uh, many, many individuals. Uh, they, they are so worried about what can happen to them that they start to actually believe that government can be uh, the savior. 
Mahatma Gowan behaves in a very terrible fashion. He is pushing for a very radical left-wing agenda that's entirely pro-death in many ways by uh, legalizing recently the killing of the most vulnerable elements of the society by euthanasia and also the killing of the babies uh, through abortion on demand. So this is a man who has no regard for human life at all and his uh, attitude is very arrogant and he has imposed some uh, laws that are absolutely arbitrary and they remove uh, not only uh, basic elements of the rule of law, but they also, uh, and more specifically, they undermine the principle of separation of powers, turning the, his government not only into the legislator, but also the executor of his own laws. And that's the path that leads to tyranny, as Montesquieu put it so well in his uh, book uh, on the spirit of the law. We've also seen, well, the peaking, as I call it, of uh, the rising paternalistic nanny state in Australia, the tyranny of, of public health experts. And uh, Australians have become quite accustomed to bigger and bigger government over the past three decades. And wh whether it be issues such as climate change, it's always been trust the experts, listen to the, the the science and obviously not many people know know really or are, are willing to uh look up for themselves at how covid coronavirus actually actually works and leaders such as mark mcgowan uh, dan andrews they're they're able to get away with these uh draconian measures uh, restricting Libya, imposing a police state saying it's following the health advice uh, obviously we understand that we've never required people to do this before but this is health advice you wouldn't go against the implications yeah. you wouldn't go against the advice of your gp yes but we have to uh, take into account that some of these health advisors they are actually uh, not as qualified as very prominent academics in the United States coming from Yale or Harvard University as well, uh, telling us, Professor Yonides, uh, Professor Katz and many others uh, saying that these lockdowns are going to lead to uh, further um, causalities, including perhaps more deaths than if they had uh, taken a, a different approach. And the result of this is a massive uh, uh, depression uh, in employment rates going to skyrocket and also alcoholism and domestic violence as a result so uh, and the measures that have been taken have been taken by people who don't have a holistic approach and they actually have no knowledge of real epidemiology they are just uh, uh, versed in, in me the medical area the medical field but um, this is a problem that has a holistic uh, should have a holistic approach. We should have people who understand, uh, for instance, uh, constitutional law is a good example, because uh, the preservation of our fundamental rights and freedoms are at the stake at the moment that we are losing the uh, gradually our fundamental rights. And it's very important to bear in mind that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, and certainly these uh, health experts, they do not have the same level of democratic accountability that politicians might do have. And they are being given all these tasks and responsibilities that are not uh, um, subscribed to them according to the basic principles of the rule of law. We've seen a, a few court challenges to these emergency uh, decrees and measures, uh, public health orders, uh, but it seems to me that uh, Australian courts, they're, they're, they're too timid to slap down well, popular decisions by, by politicians or well, at, at the at the more hyperbolic level, measures to stop the the spread of a, a pandemic, and obviously the the the, the most uh, restrictive measure were uh, one of the most restrictive measures, I should say, uh, was uh, Mark McGowan's hard border closure, which yes. uh, was uh, challenged by Clive Palmer under Section Two 
of the Constitution, but the High Court of Australia said no, the WA Public Health Act uh, is, uh, it, it, it does not violate Section 92 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Of course, it violates the, the chapter, or better saying the section, uh, this particular section in the Constitution, Section 92. I have written an article to explain how much it violates, but any kid in Darwin, the child would be able to know that the word absolute means absolute. I think the, I think now I'm perhaps sure that the framers uh, of our constitution, in order to make this statement so clear, they said that intercourse and the free uh, uh, ex exchange of, of commerce, uh, they have to be absolutely free. And that's what uh, the particular section uh, dictates. Uh, what the so High Court has done is to undermine that provision by saying that we are facing emergency, an emergency, um, emergency situation. But that's nowhere to be found in the Constitution itself. There is nothing in the Constitution that would allow for this sort of uh, creative interpretation of the court and empowering uh, Premier McGowan to behave in a dictatorial fashion. Uh, what really concerns me is the fact that the pr prime minister of this country, coming from a supposed liberal party, has actually cheered with the victory of the, the Labour Party and even claimed the credit for the recent election. So what he says is that um, he supports the violation of fundamental rights in Western Australia and he supports the ultimate undermining of the constitution uh, by premiers. Uh, nothing of this would be happening if the prime minister of this country were not empowering these little dictators to behave in such an outrageous manner. Well, I think Scott Morrison, he's uh, been uh, politically intimidated by how popular uh, these premiers are. Uh, he mm -hmm. saw the election result last year in the, the Queensland state election with uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk increasing her majority with her border closure with New South Wales. And then obviously with he saw the West Australian ele election result uh, on the wall uh, for a while and he's changed his tune pretty much saying that whatever, no matter how ridiculous a snap lockdown is or the whether a state wants to put up a, a border or not, he's just said, well, it's up to them and we'll provide whatever support. Because the narrative has been entirely controlled by the left. Uh, perhaps being a left-wing person himself, uh, Scott Morrison is taking delight in the suppression of these freedoms. Please do not forget that before this lockdown, he was uh, known for being an opponent of freedom of speech. Uh, he even uh, when Israel for all was being criticized for his comments, he was giving credit to rugby league. He only changed his mind when he realized that his approach was becoming unpopular. This is a man who has no commitment to free speech. He claims that he doesn't ever give the free speech, doesn't give a single job, when as a matter of fact, or doesn't create a single job. When, as a matter of fact, the lack of free speech is causing many people to lose their jobs, including Professor uh, Reid in uh, that university. Uh, what's the name? James Cook James University. James Cook University, yeah. Exactly. And uh, he was uh, challenging the narrative of the establishment of the status quo, which uh, mm -hmm. basically the prime minister epitomizes. And he pay paid a very high price for this. What uh, is really, really scary in this country is that the politicians, they think they are above the law. Yeah, certainly the premier will be able to travel into the state and having a good life where everybody live, lives under his rule in a very oppressive fashion. And uh, the, the elites probably found a very good excuse for this is the fear of death. The fear of death is uh, now uh, making people exchange all other freedoms and rights for the supposed right of the government to protect them. That reminds me of Hobbes, this whole idea that uh, uh, we exchange our, our, our preservation of our life, better saying our freedoms for the preservation of our life. 
And the life and the idea that the government is the ultimate protector is becoming so prevalent that in the end of the day, a society that, um, uh, you know, uh, puts uh, the right to be alive above everything, you end up not having this protection because of the fact that governments can become so oppressive that they ultimately can eventually even undermine their very right to stay alive. Uh, having lived uh, through that 112-day uh, stage for Melbourne lockdown, I can tell you there wasn't much quality of life, which is always what uh, they, they leave out when they justifying these draconian measures to protect human life. It was an absolutely miserable time here. Uh, you and P uh, uh, Perth got a, a taste of it with the, the, the five-day snap lockdown. But a, a, as uh, you've pointed out, uh, uh, Dan Andrews and his government are still incredibly... Uh, popular and the the Victorian Liberal Party. Well, after the events of of this week with the failed spill, they they look even more of a rabble. Yeah, but they they, they endorse the argument of the of the Labour Party and the left wing parties. What's happening here is that the Liberal Party has become a sort of Labour light, and even in this election here in Western Australia, there was a total lack of alternative. We had a very idiotic uh, leader of the opposition a young person who uh, certainly behaved in, a, in such a manner very responsibly, uh, claiming that uh, he had uh, an energy policy that would embarrass even the Greens. Not even the Greens would be so stupid to promise that in five years we would not have uh, coal anymore, or, and certainly in, in 10 years there would be a total uh, reliable, um, a renewable energy policy, and that would basically be the end of... Uh, of, uh, of, you know, coal and other forms of uh, traditional energy. Uh, that was uh, such a, a crazy remark that um, the leader of the opposition became a subject of ridicule. And then he started to uh, uh, say things that are coming from a very left-wing perspective. We know very well that he supports the uh, LGBTQ agenda, agenda in full force. And he is also a supporter of every single piece of legislation the government has passed, that especially the most uh, uh, controversial ones. Uh, so, in a certain sense, what happened in West Nassau was a total lack of confidence that the Liberal Party would make anything different. He was, for instance, a strong support of the borders, the strong borders. So if you vote for him, there would be no difference at all. Uh, yeah. The problem that I see is the lack of alternative and the fact that the Liberal Party has been taken over by members of the left. Well, don't forget that uh, the South Australian Liberal Premier Stephen Marshall, he basically pioneered uh, this uh, new phenomenon of the snack, snap lockdown uh, due to a, a few cases that had escaped from from hotel quarantine uh, he also uh, put up uh, hard borders uh, if there are outbreaks in in other states and i know that gladys berejiklian is described as having the the gold standard when it comes to to, to covid uh, but the 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 cost of well the 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 trade off is as though you've got although she's not locking down areas apart from the northern beaches over christmas she's got this centralized qr code database which essentially tracks where every person in new south wales has been which is a another issue yeah. or problem yeah. coming out of this pandemic yeah. well look uh, uh, thanks for for referring to this fact because the liberal part was disseminated as a result of being labor light i don't like diet coke I would rather have normal one, but now that they have gone woke, I don't even buy anymore. But I tell you one thing: the problem with the Liberal Party is that they want to be uh, reaching out the left and with this uh, environmental policy. What is most uh, uh, disturbing here is that the uh, last of the Mohicans now, one of the remaining members, we I think there is only there are only three now members of the Liberal Party Parliament, is the main culprit of the disaster 
that took place here in Western Australia is that guy called David Honey. This man is an extreme leftist. He should be joining the Communist Party. The man is a disgrace. He even came to the point now of accusing uh, conservatives for having been responsible for the defeat. He referred to the uh, so-called religious right. Well, if he opposes the religious right, I think I can call him the ungodly left because he is the opposite of the religious right. That now we have, uh, as one of the leaders of the party parliament, a member of the ungodly left, a man who has nothing uh, about classical liberal values in his veins. And oh, they they were pretty quick to well shun uh, or dismiss uh, candidates who who had uh, Christian views or well uh, you'd say alternate views. Uh, if I go to this mm. this uh, 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 one of uh, uh, one of the uh, liberal candidates, Andrea. Uh, Toje, who Tokaji, or, Tokaji. Tokaji, yeah, she, yeah. They, this is from the SMH, uh, reports that uh, on Cauldron Pool, which is a website that you've written for, yeah, uh, talking about the, the and, and this was early in April 2020, and she mentioned or well, explored the, the, the rollout of 5G, which is not a, a theory uh, about the spread of COVID that, that I support and isn't mm -hmm. supported by much evidence, yeah. but she was cut loose instantly like yeah. that and then another not that one uh, yeah, uh this uh, candidate here was 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 gagged um amanda sue markham who was mm -hmm. married to pastor campbell markham well look uh, it is a, a disgrace what happened because i suppose that I, to be frank if you are, I already knew that this uh, wasn't so but the Liberal Party is supposed to be an umbrella party where we have people from all sorts of walks. And the idea of being a liberal is exactly that we would have a freedom to expose and express ideas and have these ideas being challenged in the marketplace of ideas in a proper manner. The way uh, they treated Andrea Tokaji was absolutely despicable. Uh, the, the lady actually wrote a very good article for Cauldron Pool, apart from that paragraph that I totally disagree with. Uh, I certainly think there's nothing to make a link between 5G with, with COVID. I find it bizarre. But the rest of the article is fantastic when she's talking about her uh, legacy, you know, the fact that she came with her family uh, fleeing from communism, perhaps the leader of opposition here is very concerned that communism has been criticized. I don't know. Zach seems to be such a, a, a commie that perhaps that is the reason they got rid of her. But she made excellent points about communist oppression and, and also uh, the fact that uh, the governments were perhaps uh, exaggerating on the policies and measures that were taking to uh, fight the virus. I agree entirely. As a constitutional lawyer, I'm extremely worried about the undermining of fundamental legal rights as a result of what's happening. Then she wrote this excellent article apart from that terrible paragraph. But they didn't give her a right to explain herself. What happened reminds me of Stalin's Soviet Union or the behavior of the Gestapo uh, during Nazi Germany, where they just executed the sender of the message. Uh, what Zach and his mafia did to the Etokash was absolutely repulsive. A party that claims to be a party that's of liberty and freedom didn't allow her even to explain herself properly. They, they fired her on the phone. What can be more cruel than that? I think they should be deeply ashamed of themselves. Yeah, they didn't even uh, give her a chance to reply, maybe put it in some context. And it was published nearly exactly. a year ago when there was a lot of unknowns about the, the virus at the, the time. And exactly. I'm sure that uh, if she was asked about it, uh, she uh, w would have more refined views about the virus. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, we thank goodness I, have, I don't remember to have ever written something of this nature. Uh, I feel sorry for her, 
But uh, on the other hand, uh, Andrea is a human rights activist in the right sense of the word because she fights for real human rights, the rights of real refugees, for instance. And uh, it, she would be a great asset for the party. And it seems that she was campaigning very hard. What happened is so cruel because she was actually an excellent campaigner and, and people were uh, appreciating her comments. They destroyed her character. They tried to assassinate her, her image. And it was all done by the Zach guy in his group because um, she was one of the most active, charismatic candidates that we had. And she fights for human rights. What's the problem? Does it, doesn't he like human rights? What's the problem with him? I really don't know, but uh, uh, this whole thing makes me rather suspicious. And uh, the other candidate who wasn't disendorsed but gagged, uh, Amanda Sue Markham, which, yeah. well, if you if you can't really, if the leader gags you, then you can't really do much in a, in a campaign. Yeah, the, the, the detail is that it seems that this whole thing is based on the comments made by another person, namely her yeah. husband. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. My wife has the right to have an opinion. It doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything she says. But how can I be punished for, for the things that others have said? Is that a person who has such a totalitarian worldview that he doesn't understand that I will never be responsible for the things that my mother, my, my daughter, or my dog, whoever says, I have no responsibility over that. And um, it's the fact that the fact that he was uh, uh, trying to somehow prevent her to bas basically be what she is and, 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 and discuss these matters with the public, it's really despicable. It actually uh, reminds me of what they did to Sherry Sufi when she, he was a candidate in Fremantle. Sherry is uh, from Pakistan and he was opposing same-sex marriage. Somehow they found something in his curriculum to get rid of him. So it's a very strange party where if you have something in your curriculum that you put there is not exactly like that, you must be executed. But if you have an affair with a woman from the Greens and you are the treasurer, you can be forgiven as it happened to Troy's Boswell here. Or if you have an affair as an attorney general with people and becoming a little bit of a uh, controversial character in Canberra for having his sexual adventures, then you'll be forgiven as well. So it's a very strange thing that uh, these people have such a dubious moral standards. That's why I'm so honored and delighted to have resigned from the Liberal Party, a party that I happen to be the senior vice president in Fremantle. But I thought that remaining in the party would very severely damage my image and my reputation not just as an academic, but as a human being. At the federal level, the uh, the Liberal Party has always performed strongly in Western Australia. Currently, they hold 11 of the, the 16 seats, but with the, the AUC redistribution, WA will, will lose a seat. Uh, there's obviously a lot of speculation about where that uh, will be, uh, but uh, obviously, uh, state, state and federal issues te tend to be, voters tend to, to separate them, but if such a result was anywhere near replicated here at uh, a federal level, and obviously with the uh, departure of, of, of some of the more, it, it, some of the more, what would you call them, WA liberals at the federal level who have stature, such as Julie Bishop, and uh, Matthias Coleman, who got the, the job as uh, the Secretary General of the, the OACD. Uh, mm -hmm. there, uh, you, you, you referenced Christian Porter there. Uh, he is on well mental health leave until the end of the, the, the month after adding himself as the minister accused of historical rape and is now uh, proceeding with uh, defamation against Louise Milligan and the ABC. You have mm -hmm. uh, Linda Reynolds, also on yeah. medical leave, uh, followed well, by... Well, okay, look, we have a, a defence minister who is on health leave because of an issue that happened in his office. Can you imagine how we can have a, a defence minister if we, if we have a situation that, for instance, China declares war on, on us and she has a collapse, she has a, she has a mental breakdown. I mean, we cannot have her as a defense minister. She can't cope with this small problem, a situation that's really terrible, but uh, 
Uh, it's much of a lesser gravity than if we are engaged in a, in a war against China or against the, I don't know. It, it's just the, quite clear to me that she's not the person fit for the, the, the position. You need to find someone who is not freaking out all the time for any circumstances. A defense minister has to be a very bold, strong, and courageous individual. Uh, what did you make of... Well, it got leaked to the media that she called uh, Brittany Higgins a, a lying cow in, a, in her office, not in regard to the rape allegation, but that she didn't receive enough su support. Then Brittany Higgins' lawyer sent a defamation notice and Linda Reynolds settled that, uh, paid a, a sum of her own money the, the, the next week. What did you make of that whole uh, uh, defamation case and settlement? Because it was quite unusual. Yeah, well, to be frank with you, uh, this uh, lady was uh, not into trouble as a result of the fact that she apparently was abused. But she um, entered in the building after hours together with another man, and she actually committed uh, an illicit use. Uh, she was not supposed to be in the building, she was not supposed to be drunk, and she was not supposed to be doing the things that she did. So after uh, we have the fact, uh, uh, of course, that um, oh, something really terrible might have occurred. We are forgiving her for the crimes that she committed that were infractions of the rules of parliament. After our rules of parliament, nobody's saying this. I mean, nobody, nobody's quiet. Uh, it, this whole episode is really disgraceful. Uh, Linda Reynolds has a problem. Uh, with he, her approach that tends to be very inclusive, but in the wrong sense of the word. She even made a, a ridiculous statement a couple of years ago, saying that you should have mixed AFL teams. Uh, so that tells me that how stupid the person can be, saying that AFL teams should have mixed players of, uh, of both genders. And this is a, was a subject of ridicule for obvious reasons. Uh, and I so she that wants she to create... That. She wants to create an army with all sorts of inclusive groups, homosexuals, transgenders. I thought that to have an army is to have the best people who can protect us, and it shouldn't be a matter of political correctness or affirmative action policies that she's pushing. So the sooner she goes, the better. And uh, also the, the other uh, WA federal Liberal MPs, the the most senior one at the moment is uh, Michaela Cash, who has had quite a a a, a colourful career. As uh, well, so it has you could say nine political lives. She 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 survived what was described as the the whiteboard incident uh, after a staffer resigned after a a media leak. And you mentioned uh, uh, Linda, uh, Linda Reynolds, uh, def uh, defence minister in charge of defence personnel, but then you have uh, Melissa Price, also a WA Liberal MP, uh, defence industry mi minister, and that's a whole other, other area of defence which Australia is struggling with. And that was a demotion that she got because she was so terrible as environment minister before the, the last election. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so you see that we are not very well served here. That's perhaps the reason as to why Scott Morrison claimed credit for the uh, Labour uh, landslide uh, victory recently. The, the landslide was uh, in amazing. Uh, it left the Liberal Party with probably two and no more than three members in the parliament. And I think what Scott, Scott Morrison is doing is to say the premiers are popular, the Labour premiers in particular, including this uh, uh, dreadful premier in Victoria, but he's saying, I, I have empowered them, I have helped them to violate the constitution, I should claim credit for being also in, uh, empowering these oppressors. So. Uh, Scott Morrison, perhaps realizing that the Liberal Party is finished in Western Australia, it will be trying to run a campaign saying, if you want to have me uh, as a Prime Minister, let's disassociate us from the state uh, uh, branch of the Liberal Party, and let's have only these federal hopeless politicians that we have in, in Western Australia to support me, so we can continue to destroy the economy of the country and to destroy the fundamental rights of the people. 
And, the, and, and what I'm not, as I say, it, and I repeat it again, I'm not surprised that the ruling elites have no, no regard for the people because, after all, I was um, uh, president of the division here, a commissioner, and I know very well what they, what they are capable of doing. But what surprises me is the naivety of the Australian people. It's how stupid people can be to think that these politicians have any regard for them when they're actually mocking them and laughing at them on the backs. In your uh, book, there, there's also a, a chapter on, on civil disobedience in the, the COVID age, which obviously you... Uh, thankfully, uh, just saw from afar the, the the brutal conduct of Victoria Police over the uh, the, the second half of, of twenty twenty, suppressing the the various Freedom Day uh, events, and well, that's uh, continued uh, into twenty twenty one. Even though we have uh, slightly less onerous restrictions, there's still public gathering limits of uh, 100, uh, that uh, uh, obese assistant commissioner, Luke Cornelius, uh, he's, uh, he, he still is the operations manager of all the, the, the public order response. There's another rally this weekend, the, the Worldwide Rally for Freedom, which is occurring nationwide. But again, it's a, another, you'd say, indicator of uh, just how much of a police state Victoria still is, even though Dan Andrews is in the uh, the sick ward uh, for at least the, the next six weeks. Uh, but all of yeah. these uh, protests and the, the conduct of Victoria Police, it still hasn't had any impact at all in changing much public opinion, not just in Victoria, but uh, elsewhere. Well, when I lived in Victoria about 20 years ago, I knew this would end up like that because of the uh, fact that my uh, fellow Australians, especially in Victoria, have this sort of uh, naivety when it comes to what governments can do in the labor. So uh, it's not surprising in a certain sense. But and when I, we refer to that um, article on civil resistance and uh, the fight for, uh, according to our tradition, the lawful right to resist oppression. I'm not actually saying that, uh, that uh, we are going to uphold this uh, tradition. That's a tradition that led to the development of Western, Western constitutionalism. And uh, this article is based on a more comprehensive uh, chapter uh, in a book written by Emeritus Professor Gabriel Moines, one of our uh, brightest legal minds in this country, an amazing academic, one of the top constitutional lawyers, who was basically appealing to John Locke and our tradition of the rule of law, namely, according to even uh, our first uh, chief justice in this country, Samuel, Samuel uh, Grift, Sir Samuel Grift, uh, where he, in one of the first decisions of the High Court, made it very clear that the pur purpose of the law and judicial enforcement of the law is the protection of the basic rights of the individual to life, liberty, and property. So if any measure affects these three basically basic elements uh, of uh, natural law, the natural rights, we have, according to this tradition, the right to resist. It's actually a lawful right because it, the measures being arbitrary, they violate the rule of law in the first place. It is not wrong to fight against oppression. It's not wrong to say to a ruler who violates the rule of law that you have the right lawfully to resist. And that's what I try to explain in the article. But just to make it a little bit disappointing now, I don't think Australians know this aspect of our tradition because they have been dumped down by our legal system, or sorry, our educational system, and they have now developed a total lack of knowledge of who they are by means of the deconstructionist uh, policies of multiculturalism. So unfortunately, Australians have no idea of their own rights and freedoms. They have no idea of who they are, and that's why they are very prone to become enslaved and oppressed by these uh, ruling elites because they have no idea and no sense of human dignity. 
we're also uh, it's quite obvious that there's a lot of selecting selective uh, policing going on particularly in victoria the fact that these uh, march for justices could occur all throughout australia with with the uh, the uh police no well uh, you'd say well all that all the only instances of police moving in is when uh, a few feminist activists glued themselves to the the intersection in Flinders Street uh, in in Melbourne. So there, there's definitely equality of the law was thrown out a, a long long time ago. But uh, we're seeing well, it it, uh, it was turbocharged by Brittany Higgins' uh, allegation. Obviously, uh, Grace Tame being named uh, Australian of the of the year uh, definitely put the the issue of. Uh, uh, assault and violence against women at the the forefront, and then there's obviously the the allegation, uh, historical allegation against Christian Porter. I call this mm -hmm. the the Me Too two point mm -hmm. movement, and they obvi uh, the it's, it's hard to tell what their demands are, but clearly they are wanting to to, to undermine our current rule of law legal system and just basically replace our legal system with kangaroo courts where they get the outcomes that they want. Yes, and all this was, uh, should be uh, addressed by the Attorney General before. Uh, unfortunately, he gave an interview to the Q&A uh, saying that women should be believed. Uh, I think I think now I'm 100 percent sure that he now doesn't doesn't think the same. Uh, you know when it well, happens he said to that. you, he said yeah, that he said that about five years ago in a Q well, and A. Yeah, you, you, you've got such you've got an even good encyclopedia <laughs> political <laughs> encyclopedia of memory than myself. Yes, and you know uh, Scott Morrison also spent 500 million dollars in a domestic violence uh, feminist campaign to demonize uh, white men in this country. So uh, they are, they're getting what they created. It's a really terrible thing that now they are, especially Christian parties, having to face this situation. But um, the case of, of Christian Porter reminds me what happened to that Father Fleming in South Australia. I don't know if you know the case, but uh, the, he was uh, uh, falsely accused by a newspaper when the police has, had proven that, that uh, the accusations had no evidence. Uh, he uh, was discharged, and uh, what happened after this is that the local newspaper in South Australia published an article vilifying him. The funny thing, the, the funny, the terrible thing, the, the the interesting aspect, if I can put it like that, is that um, Father Fleming's name was referred uh, uh, in the article, so it was mentioned. And it was mentioned as a person had committed a terrible crime about 30 years ago, raping a girl. It's very similar uh, story. Uh, but Father Fleming certainly is innocent. And, uh, and he sued the newspaper for that. Uh, the amazing thing is that it was a defamation case. He was entirely innocent. There was no criminal conviction, nothing. And the judge absurdly uh, didn't give him the, the victory there. He lost his defamation lawsuit. And, and then he appealed to the Supreme Court. He lost again. And the High Court refused to uh, receive a special leave in order to entertain the matter. So he didn't have the chance that Cardinal Pell had because he doesn't have the power, perhaps he doesn't have the money to have the High Court giving a chance to him. So in the end of the day, he has his life completely destroyed. And this is an innocent man. What I did was to send a letter to Christian Porter informing him on this matter, asking for his help. And the, the irony of this is that this can set up a precedent now, and the precedent can now be used against Christian Porter himself. So my understanding of the matter, and just wait a little bit more because I'm writing the subject I'll publish as an article, is that Christian Porter is running the risk of losing the case, and that will be very bad for him. If he thinks that his defamation lawsuit will be successful, it will be giving him the, the outcome that he expects, I think he might be uh, quite disappointed in the end of the day. 
uh, the person who will be uh, the judge if the case is eventually decided uh, by a federal judge is a person who was appointed by, in the right government, by Kevin Rudd. And she is very loved by the left. And by the way, her, appoint, her uh, promotion to the High Court was rejected by Christian Porter himself. So she, he doesn't have a person who really likes him to be uh, deciding on the matter. And that precedent that he refuses to have, he refused to help when he could have offered help, and he refused, can now be used against him and can lead to a very undesirable outcome. So I really feel sorry for Christian, and I think there is a good chance that he's going to lose his lawsuit. And if that happens, it'll be politically spun as, is that he's guilty of that historical he allegation. Yeah. Now, another uh, issue that uh, you've written about uh, is uh, the state of uh, religious freedom and, and liberty in Australia. Now, uh, Scott Morrison, uh, he identifies as a Pentecostal Christian in, well, it was actually Malcolm Turnbull who, in response to the, the legalization of same-sex marriage, set up the Religious Freedom Review and, and Scott Morrison announced that uh, he wanted, if he won the 2019 federal election, set up a, a Federal Religious uh, Discrimination Act. Now, mm. I know that uh, you at the time, and so did I, were concerned uh, that this could end up becoming a, a blasphemy act, uh, sort of like how our Victorian Racial and Religious Tolerance Act worked, but it was still Scott Morrison's solution to uphold religious freedom and liberty. <coughs> but uh, to show how much uh, he actually cares about the issue, it seems to have been put on the back burner. We haven't heard anything about it. Well, yes, but... Um Anyway, it might be a blessing in disguise because you know that Christian Porter was on the same days and uh, the piece of, uh, of uh, law proposal, the bill that they were uh, uh, thinking about uh, introducing in Parliament was a disaster. Uh, he wanted to actually further empower the Human Rights uh, Law, the Human Rights uh, Commission, the Australian Human Rights Commission. And the Human Rights Commission uh, is notorious for violating human rights. And you have, for instance, the case of these students in QUT who were fighting against racism, who were accused of being racist, but, and the Human Rights Commission didn't help them. So the Human Rights Commission, it's a it's terrible, a terrible entity. And then they would a add the, the, race, the religious elements to the other elements, such as race and gender. Uh, that is going the wrong way. So, um, uh, of course, that tells me a lot about their commitment to religious freedom, undoubtedly, because they could create a decent religious freedom act. But even if the, the religions act that they created was a decent one, which is almost impossible to happen in this government, they can't even repeal Section 18C. I mean, you're asking a government to... to which is another one in your box. And they are incapable even to repeal a, a, a simple provision in the Anti-Discrimination Act that has been used as an instrument of oppression, the silencing of opposition and people who fight for human rights are being uh, victims of this law. But I can tell you one thing. Rather than thinking about creating more junk, because this would be used by the anti-discrimination industry, what we really need to do is to start repealing the existing provisions that undermine freedom of speech. I was really concerned about the hijacking of this approach of the Religious, Religious Freedom Act by radical extremists, especially coming from the Muslim uh, religion, that, who were basically trying to use this as an opportunity to silence debate on the matters of religion. And Scott Morrison was going to mosques, claiming that this would be what he would be doing, protecting Muslims and members of other religions for criticism. I think what do we need? What we really need is more freedom. And religious freedom, together with other freedoms, will be better served if you repeal at least 50% of the existing laws that we have, starting with anti-discrimination law. We need to get rid of every single one of them because they have been used as an instrument of bigotry and of oppression. Because the more intolerant you are, 
the more you feel offended. And if the threshold is offendedness, the law will inevitably be used as an instrument of tyranny, of oppression, and of the silencing of our different opinions by the bigots. The real bigots use the law for their own benefit as a result. Yes, I completely agree. And uh, they're, they're, they're still going after your friend, uh, Margaret Court, who, who runs the, the Victory Life Church over in, in, in Perth uh, over her views on LGBT issues, which she doesn't speak about that often. It's just that the, uh, the, the, uh, the activists just choose to get offended over her beliefs. And, they, and she was dragged back into the, uh, the, the, the political fire, firing line there because, well, she was rightfully awarded an AC, Australia Day Honour, the, the highest uh, honour. Mm -hmm. And uh, our Premier over here, Dan Andrews, had the nerve to criticise her, saying that uh, her views cause, 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 cause deaths. Yeah. Well, look, okay. where is the Prime Minister on the politics? He's always silent about yes. healthy issues. You know? he, he never says anything to protect us and to, to fight for the rights of people to have a different opinion. Um, he was silent again and did nothing about the statements made by this... Uh, uh, premier. So now, to make it even worse, one of the leaders of, of the, the remaining members of the Liberal Party here in, in our parliament hates Christians. I mean, he's saying that the problem in the Liberal Party is that we have too many Christians. And that's what this is what he said in that, uh, and you can find this in the article uh, written by uh, the person in this Advanced Australia website. Yep. So, so, and th then he got it from the Financial Review, by the way, where uh, this person called Dave DeHoney is saying that um, we have, they have a problem with the religious, the, the Christians in the party. Uh, I, I just find it amazing. So you have, for instance, Margaret Court, and Margaret Court is such a lovely lady. I, and you know what? It's a court family. And the, Richard Court uh, is uh, Margaret Court's uh, brother-in-law. -in uh, um, uh, you know, Charles Court is her father-in-law, and Bear is a very committed Christian. Are these guys really so bold now that they can actually say that the people who are actually very important in the of the party should actually cease to, to be in the party, perhaps, or be quiet and silent just because they happen to hold conservative Christian values, and he himself happens to disagree with because he is a, a greenie and he would be, of course, far more comfortable if he joined the Communist Party of the Greens. He, he is directly responsible for the problem when he introduced an energy policy that was so ridiculous that even the Greens would not dare to hold. Well, uh, the, uh, the uh, Zach's, uh, it wasn't a renewable energy policy. It was zero emissions by zero 2030. Emissions, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, 20, it, 2025 is the carbon thing. Can, can you read that? Just, just because I don't remember. Can, have a look at the article. Tell me what he's saying. Uh, it got the uh, support of the New South Wales Liberal Energy Minister, Matt Keane. And so there's a, there's a huge problem with uh, the Liberal Party on the, the East Coast as well, given that he seems to be one of the most powerful people in the uh, the Liberal National Government uh, in that state. He supported uh, Joe Biden for president, and he also said he uh, was quite smug in saying bye-bye to Craig Kelly from the, the Liberal Party. We don't want you here anymore. Well, look, as a matter of fact, uh, Robert Menzies would be very proud of me when I resigned from the Liberal Party, when I wrote that letter explaining that because I'm a decent man, because I'm a moral man, I couldn't find in my conscience uh, uh, the, the, the capacity, even the strength to be uh, trying to change the Liberal Party or, uh, by remaining in the Liberal Party. Uh, Robert Menzies... Uh, was like me in this sense, or I am like him, they're the same. Let's put this in a chronological order. But uh, I'm inspired by him. He was a great man. First of all, he was not afraid to be, a, a, as I am, a proud Presbyterian. And he mentions God all the time in his speeches. There is no problem whatsoever, even because a Western 
constitutional law tradition is based on the likes of John Locke and Sir Edward Cook. And if you see, they were not more Christians than I am, because they were more fanatically committed to their faith than I am. So the, the whole tradition of individual rights and freedoms, inalienable rights, the fight against tyranny, it's all coming from this Christian uh, philosophy and tradition. These people were directly inspired by um, Christian values. To be saying that these people, just because uh, Margaret Court and others, they are the heirs to the classical liberal tradition, they are not welcome in the liberal party, is outrageous. But they either don't know history, or they are trying to rewrite it and, and make it in a different way. Because if you are a classical liberal Christian, you are closer to the founding fathers of the nation than ever, especially the founders of classical liberalism, the likes of Locke, the likes of Thomas Jefferson and others, who were not afraid of saying that uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That's just because these rights are not state-given. Otherwise, they couldn't be inalienable or self-evident. They believe that these rights are coming directly from a creator. But apart from this, even if you don't believe that, isn't that good to know that some people believe so that these rights cannot be removed by the state? If the state takes away, gives these rights, the state can take away, and blessed will be the name of this state. I don't think the state is the supreme authority. Our rights are belonging to us and should not be given and trusted to any authority whatsoever. Uh, there's an expression that's repeated is, uh, recently uh, that uh, a, a state which can provide you with everything can take it all away. And yes. as you pointed out, the fallacy that our rights are given from the government because that implies that they can take it away again. Yeah. I want to get your uh, thoughts on the, well, the well, it's ongoing uh inquiry into extremist uh, movements uh, in the the era of the the COVID pandemic. We had the, the ASIO chief, Mike Burgess, uh, last night talk about how that uh, they're, no, they're no longer going to, to use the term uh, far-right extremism or Islamic extremism, going to use the term ideologically motivated violent extremism and religiously motivated violent extremism. The, the biggest proponent of this inquiry was uh, Labour's uh, shadow home spokeswoman, Christina Keneally. She's been demanding Peter Dutton put uh, far-right groups on the on the, the terror list, uh, though yesterday here in Melbourne, we got a reminder of the, well, their, their, their ongoing Islamist uh, threat with uh, Victoria Police. Well, it took a bit, it it took a bit of questioning to, to get it out that the terror arrests were uh, Islamic extremism related. Where do you see this inquiry going? And uh, well, especially you... since um, what Mike Burgess said of Asia last night. If it comes from Christine Kennelly, nothing good can come from her. Uh, you remember that uh, you have that, that gentleman, Andrew Cooper, who held an event here uh, with yes, APAC, CPAC. And the, CPAC, and he invited Tony Abbott and others. And guess what the Department of the Attorney General did? Used, uh, for the first time, the law of agents of foreign influence against them, and, and they got into big trouble. This uh, woman there, uh, Christine Kennelly, and she was actually applauding this, and she went to Parliament to say that the law was being properly used. Uh, she has no no concern for uh, allowing people to have a different opinion. She loves to label others. The woman is in, in, intrinsically intolerant uh, of other opi people's opinions. Uh, that is a very bad sign when you have her supporting any measure whatsoever. I will naturally be opposed to them. If she supports something, there is something wrong with the proposal. Uh, but going back to the proposal, uh, this is a wishy-washy, morally relativistic approach where it cannot be more precise in the description of, uh, of these movements. It really makes me suspicious that uh, they want to include some right-wing groups, but they don't want to describe them as such so that they can initiate a process that will be more of silencing of the um, groups that they particularly dislike. Obviously, obviously, 
that 99% of the groups that cause real violence are coming from two main uh, sectors of the political spectrum. One is the Islamic sect, uh, aspect and the other is the, the extreme left, especially groups such as Black Lives Matter, a fascistic movement, and another fascistic movement that's now uh, causing all sorts of problems in America is that one, um, uh, the... Um, Antifa. Antifa, yeah. And it is, um, even uses, uses the colors of Mussolini's uh, brigade on the streets. And Mussolini used the black color as the color of his paramilitary group. And Antifa uses exactly the same colors. So they are very much inspired by the principles of fascism in Italy. And then uh, they claim to be Antifa, which is a very uh, deceptive approach, but it that reminds me of... Uh, uh, what George Orwell said, that one day right would be called wrong, wrong, right, uh, wrong right, liberty would be called slavery and vice versa. So these people claiming to be fascists, they are the real fascists and they are very much inspired by the tactics and methods used by Mussolini and what not, why not to say by Lenin as well in the Soviet Union. Uh, now, when I last had you, or well, it was one of the final episodes of the Un Unshackled Waves, uh, when I last chatted with you, we talked about uh, Bol uh, Jair Bolsonaro's uh, Brazil. And mm. uh, during the, the, the pandemic, uh, he's been very vocal in wanting to keep uh, Brazil open and free, but he's been well, thwarted, undermined by the, the state governors. And I noticed that the, the international media is especially focused on the, the outbreaks and deaths in Brazil seemingly to attack him. And he mm -hmm. got coronavirus uh, himself. Uh, he recovered. He credited hydroxychloroquine uh, and also had some other colourful things to say about uh, what, mm -hmm. uh, what, what happens uh, to certain people if they, they get the virus. Uh, how do you think he's overall handled the, the, the pandemic uh, f from, well, not just a, a health perspective, but from, well, basically a societal perspective? Yeah, he got the virus and others uh, uh, leaders uh, also contracted this um, virus, including Boris Johnson and uh, Donald Trump, and they recovered. So I'm not so worried about even myself contracting the virus because I'm quite healthy. Uh, the chances of a person uh, below the age of 60 to die of the disease is basically zero. Uh, if you are above 60 and you have a, a health condition, then you start to run into risks. That's why the lockdown measures are so stupid and so cruel and actually a violation of human rights, because you should protect the most vulnerable elements of the society and not destroy the economy and undermine the lives of so many innocent people. Certainly the lockdowns are going to lead to all sorts of unintended consequences of people dying of heart diseases or or other conditions that are caused by the lockdown and other restrictive measures. If you take into account how many people have died in Brazil of other causes, uh, coronavirus would be like at the number 50. Uh, there are so many others. Even crime in itself in Brazil kills far more than the virus. And then you see that these people who uh, where the deaths uh, apparently come from, they come from the states where the governors are adopting the lockdown and they oppose the government, and they are actually using, uh, inflating the numbers to um, accuse the president of having caused the problem. This figure is fabricated by, by an elite in order to put Brazil, has less of the rule of law than Australia, and we have a man there in the presidency now trying to fight against corruption, to turn the country into a developed nation, has a real concern for the rights of the people, very different from people like Scott Morrison and others here. This man in Brazil really has a concern for the people. And that's why the elites are trying to destroy him, because the oligarchies of all over the world have decided to declare war on the people in order to implement this new uh, order that they so much aspire, and that is called the Great Reset. So in Brazil, what's happening is a total uh, fabrication of numbers, Many people are now dying. If they, if they even die of a, an accident, a car accident, they, are, they, they say that they died, they died of uh, 
the person has died of, of the virus. So do not believe in these lies because it's all fabrication. It's aiming uh, to do what they did to Donald Trump. Everybody who decides to do something to protect the people against the erratic behavior and arbitrary behavior of the ruling elites will become a target of these elites and you'll do everything to destroy this person. And that's exactly what's happening to the president of Brazil. Yes, it certainly seems from afar that uh, those leaders who are wanting to, to keep their countries or jurisdictions open uh, are targeted by the elites and, well, the, the mainstream media and, yes, the, the globalists as well pushing this uh, great reset. It's been fantastic to, to finally uh, catch up with you, uh, Augusto. We've been trying for a while to, to, to tee this up. You're very busy, but also very productive uh, as well. Uh, so I'd encourage mm -hmm. people to, to read your, your regular uh, work on uh, Epoch Times. Uh, that's uh, where you've started contributing and also uh, Spectator, uh, quadrant and uh, also to consider also purchasing your books through through Conacourt Publishing as well. Thank you very much, Dean. And by the way, the, the book is uh, a publication also, apart from being Conacourt, it is also a publication of the Western Australian Jurist, that's my law journal. And the next edition will be on woke chevism, uh, the woke movement. <laughs> And they're going to get some of the best legal minds to discuss this topic. I promise to you a dream team of the best academics all over the world explaining to us uh, what this woke Chavez movement is doing. And just wait a bit because the article, the articles in this uh, new publication will be amazing. A work, a work I like I like that terminology. Well, I don't like the work itself, but it's a very, very apt uh, description. So, yes, I look yeah. forward to that that book right. as well. Take Thank care. You, Thank you. A pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.